volition. Right? Nobody dragged you, I don't think, <laughs> kicking and screaming. <laughs> what I have found is that science literacy empowers you to know when someone else is just basically full of it. <laughs> because you understand full of wrong information would be the rest of that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> it means wrong information, incorrect information. <laughs> and so when, if you understand how the world works and what the limitations are that are well determined scientifically, experimentally, then you can judge whether someone is trying to exploit your scientific ignorance. And the person exploiting you is not necessarily scientifically literate themselves. For example, they might have crystals that they want to sell you and they will claim that it will cure you of your ailments. Like I said earlier, I don't require that in advance you understand the geological crystal and structure of quartz. I won't require that of you. What I will like for you to have is a way to ask questions about that. So they say, I've got some crystals. Is your, is your first statement, great, how much do they cost? I'll buy some now. Is that your first thought? Or is it, how do they work? Why do they work? Where do you get them? How have you tested them? What kinds of ailments does it cure? Is it better for some ailments than others? Can you cure something for me right now? These are the, and by the time you're done, the person is in tears looking to find someone else to sell their crystals to. Because in fact, they don't have the, the science literacy enough themselves to back that up. Now. We, as a species, are particularly susceptible to self-delusion. So eyewitness testimony is basically the worst form of evidence you could possibly bring forth. Odd, because it's some of the highest form of evidence in the court of law, which leaves me deeply worried about the future of our legal system. Because if you come to a science lab and said, it happened this way, I swear to you, I saw it. It's like, get out of my lab. This is, I don't need, this is, I don't, you know, what did you drink this morning? Or were you awake when you made the measurements? Give me a chart recorder. Give me some other device that is independent of your emotional state. It doesn't require that you had your cup of coffee in the morning to get the proper data. Then we can start the conversation about whether your phenomena that you measured is correct. So science literacy empowers you. It inoculates you against charlatanism. But more important than that, in a free society that we tell ourselves is a capitalist society and we are blocks from Wall Street, which is the symbol of capitalism, the greatest symbol of capitalism there ever was. In a capitalist society, those in the know know that yes, one way to make money is to trade money, but at some point somebody's got to actually make stuff to sell. Hmm. Somewhere in there you got to be making something. Who makes things? Who invents things? What are the engines of tomorrow's economies? What we've known since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution is that innovations in science and technology and investments in those innovations enable nations to rise to economic power such as the strength of which they have never seen before. So that the extent to which we eschew, good SAT word there, eschew, <laughs> the extent to which we disassociate the extent to which we denigrate or, uh, or uh, presume it is of no relevance to us, the innovations of science, engineering, technology, and mathematics, that is the unraveling of the technological society that we've come to know and love that was built on the sweat equity of the generation that came before us, who understood the value of those investments. And so what would happen is America would fade to insignificance on the world stage which is a state of presence that we are unaccustomed to occupying. Now, it's your choice. In an elective society, you vote. You vote in congressmen and senators and the president. We choose the future. Yes. We don't, we're not run under dictatorships. So all I can do is alert you of the consequences of science illiteracy. I can tell you, for what it's worth, that scientists, by and large, are actually quite knowledgeable in areas outside of science. If you go to any, the home of most scientists, there'll be Bach and Beethoven and Shakespeare on the shelves. And they, they might not know as much as the literary scholar, 
But one thing that I think, as a nation, we should be embarrassed by is that the scientists, I, I, you can do this experiment yourself. I've done the experiment. The scientists, by and large, know more, know more liberal arts than the science that is known by liberal artists. And that needs to change. If you go to a science cocktail party and someone talks about Shakespeare, no one's going to say, oh, I was never good at Shakespeare. I was terrible at nouns and verbs. No, you'll never hear that. But you can go to a liberal arts party, artist parties, and someone starts talking about math. They'll say, oh, I was never good at math. I hated math. And they all chuckle. And they all agree. And they'll all like sip the next sip of champagne and go on talking about the art. And that's somehow OK. No, that's not OK. You don't have to be a scientist, but at least know, understand what's going on in the world that is shaped by decisions, many of them politically, have political consequences of the scientific decisions that inform them. So I said that backwards. It's the scientific decisions inform political decisions, and you all vote. So I'm here just to simply get you excited enough about science that you want to become scientifically literate. Otherwise, I can't, I'm not, I'm not going to beat you over the head.